Okay, so this uh, uh, this uh, uh, talk is about, uh, of course, the joint radar sensing communication, and uh, uh, the title is a little bit uh, provocative and say joint benefits for free. Um, let's see. First, of, uh, I would like to also to acknowledge uh, uh, my collaborators, in particular uh, Mari Kobayashi uh, from Superlec and uh, Technical University of Munich, Gerard Kramer from Technical University of Munich. Giulio Colavolpe from University of Parma, Lorenzo Gaudio from Parma, and then Said uh, Khalil de Cordi and Fernando Pedrazzanieto from the uh, Technical University of Berlin. Okay, the context, I think uh, uh, by now uh, we are familiar with the context because uh, it was also widely discussed in the previous uh, uh, presentation in this uh, webinar series. So uh, the idea is that uh, uh, you know, wireless networks uh, uh, transmit a lot of uh, radio uh, waveforms and a lot of energy that can be somehow or exploited. Uh, also for sensing information. And uh, uh, here I will um, mainly focus on uh, communication uh, aided by sensing rather than vice versa. Uh, in a sense that, uh, well, sensing with the uh, communication waveforms is uh, expensive. Uh, so it's not really for free, but uh, the expenditure uh, I we will see comes in terms of complexity, because of course, uh, 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 and it is uh, like a typical radar waveforms are also designed to enable uh, low complexity uh, detection schemes, while uh, OFDM or TFS, whatever uh, digital modulation waveform is designed to carry information and therefore extracting uh, uh, sensing information is, is uh, typically much more expensive. However, it comes for free in the sense that it does not use more bandwidth or uh, more uh, transmit power. The waveform is there anyway to carry data, and so it's transmitted anyway. There is no added uh, expenditure in terms of uh, power bandwidth. So, okay, so this is basically more or less what I want to say. So before uh, starting, uh, I'd like to uh, somehow review a, a very simple information theoretic toy model, which actually somehow uh, shows two things. First of all, that uh, do, doing things jointly rather than sharing resources in a, let's say, orthogonal way, like putting these two systems on different uh, time slots or bandwidth, uh, is extremely convenient, it uh, gives much better performances. And also that uh, there is very, very little to uh, give up in terms of uh, information rate uh, while achieving almost uh, ideal sensing. So the, the model uh, is simply a memoryless channel that depends on a state. So the input of the channel is X the output of the channel is uh, Y, but there is also a, a state S that is a stays here in the conditioning and uh, another output that uh, can be seen as a generalized feedback. So typically the say, Shannon feedback will bring back the output to, to here, right? but uh, uh, this is a generalized feedback, uh, this, this variable Z, a uh, time I minus one is brought back by the channel. It, in a certain sense, this uh, represents the backscatter channel that uh, comes back to, to the transmitter. The, so, of course, the goal is to communicate information. So, uh, there is an information message here that has to be transferred to the receiver. The receiver has ideally perfect channel state information. So, in no The transmitter is to estimate the state of the channel. So the, 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 the estimator knowing what is transmitting and from this uh, generalized feedback wants to come up with an estimate of the state um, uh, of, of the state sequence. So uh, of course we uh, this, this channel uh, this channel model is very simple because we already know 
that uh, uh, memory uh, feedback does not increase the capacity of memory as channels. So, uh, the feedback here plays only uh, a role of enabling the estimation of the state, but does not really make uh, the, um, uh, you know, the, the change radically the transmission strategy. Of course, the, the, the model could be made more complicated by introducing a channel with memory and generalized feedback, but of course, this would be a much more difficult model. So, in this case, uh, the goal is, of course, to uh, communicate information reliably. So, with the probability of error uh, in the limit for large block uh, goes to zero, uh, and uh, estimate. So, for a given uh, distortion matrix, uh, so the classical additive distortion matrix, estimate the, the state such that the uh, the average distortion over the sequence uh, of states is less than some target D. And uh, we can study the capacity distortion uh, function for this channel, which is the supremum of uh, all rates R that are achievable uh, subject to this constraint on D. Um, and it is not difficult to show that uh, the um, the model here, uh, I mean, the, the, the result is that the uh, <coughs> the capacity uh, distortion function is the maximum of this conditional mutual information, where uh, the uh, maximum is obtained over all uh, input distributions satisfying the uh, distortion uh, constraint on the state. So in other words, uh, one has to come up with uh, an estimation variable and a probability distribution that maps uh, uh, X and Z into S hat. And uh, of course, the distribution of X uh, uh, such that this is uh, uh, this movement information is maximized. Uh, in addition, one can also easily show that uh, the, the mapping uh, of XZ onto S hat can be restricted to be a deterministic mapping. So although here we take uh, you know, this, the, the, this maximum of all possible distributions of the S hat given XZ, as a matter of fact, uh, a, a deterministic function that maps uh, uh, input X and uh, feedback uh, Z into, um, into uh, the estimated state uh, is uh, enough to uh, exhaust uh, this, this, this maximum. Um, so if we particularize this uh, simple uh, channel to a Gaussian channel with the uh, uh, fading, of course, here everything is IID because the channel is memoryless. Um, well, the Gaussian, uh, the scale Gaussian channel with fading is, is uh, uh, represented by, by, by this. So at time i, we, uh, we receive a scale version of, of, of uh, x plus noise, and the state is multiplicative with respect to the signal. Uh, and we have uh, an input uh, uh, power constraint. Uh, in addition, we consider the quadratic distortion function. Uh, and it turns out that uh, uh, you know we 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 have already some some interesting uh, thing. If we use a, a a signal x, this is a real model, so a constant envelope, so basically just plus and minus one, and so like a two pm signal. When our uh, rate is limited at, at most to one bit, in general, it would be less than one bit per per symbol, but the distortion is minimum. It's minimum because we see that this is a, is a convex function and therefore but, uh, it, it, for all signals, x, uh, all distributions uh, with a given uh, variance, uh, uh, this is minimized when x is constant. So magnitude of x is constant. So uh, the 2 pm is uh, optimal for distortion. In other, uh, on the other hand, if we make X Gaussian, of course, we achieve the, uh, the capacity of this channel, uh, but the distortion will be uh, what it will be. And uh, 
one can uh, plot this, for example, and, and see uh, that uh, this uh, distortion uh, in the state estimate uh, capacity uh, or achievable rate of the channel is uh, this red curve. Now, there are two considerations here to, uh, to do. The first consideration is, well, this point is achieved by uh, BPSK. This point is achieved by, by Gaussian inputs. But in, in fact, we notice that, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, actually, this point uh, is already uh, at the maximum uh, capacity. And the degradation in terms of estimation is very small. Or vice versa, well, this is the minimum possible distortion and the degradation in terms of rate is not that great. So this is what uh, I say uh, achieving, uh, you know, benefit for free. This curve, well, if it was just one single point here that dominates all the curve, then we will have at the same time maximum rate and minimum capacity. It's not quite that, but it's very, Pointy. There is very little trade off. Um, in contrast, if we would share resources and you know put the radar and the uh, communication on, say, orthogonal band, uh, orthogonal symbols or orthogonal bandwidth, we would move along this blue curve. And now you see that there is an enormous gap here. Uh, so this uh, suggests two things: it, it, uh, doing things jointly is better. Uh, and also, there is not much to, to give up in terms of communication when uh, um, you want to, to also estimate uh, the state. Now, uh, it turns out that for intuitively, and this is what I'm saying is an intuitive uh, statement, uh, if the channel has memory, then this generalized feedback can increase uh, the capacity of the channel with respect to the, the, the case without feedback, which means uh, is not only achieving the capacity of the channel itself or approaching that capacity uh, with a good estimation error, but the fact that we can sense the environment can actually improve uh, uh, the communication. And this, of course, is a, is a very interesting challenge is to, to look at this problem uh, in the case of channel with memory, because uh, one may, may imagine, so now what is a channel with memory? Okay, well, if the fading has memory, the, the no biggies is, uh, uh, yes, you, 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 you gain a fraction of a bit, it's not very interesting. Uh, I mean, my, my, it's interesting from a theoretical viewpoint. Uh, one has to work very hard to get nice results, but uh, the, the reward in terms, of, uh, in terms of, you know, actual gains are not that dramatic. However, there are plenty of configuration, plenty of scenarios where uh, the state of the channel is much more complicated and the memory is very important. For example, as I'm going to talk in a moment, the, the, the problem of uh, uh, beamforming in, uh, say, millimeter wave communication. So you may say that the, the, the state of the channel is the position of the, of the receiver. And the, and the position of the receiver is not changing very quickly over time. So it is a state with a lot of memory. And communicating at millimeter waves and pointing a beam in the right direction makes a whole difference, makes difference in terms of uh, uh, you know, gain, which means that if one can leverage uh, the uh, sensing information to improve the beam pointing, one can get many bits per second per hertz of improvement. Okay, so this is just a very intuitive uh, 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 and, and informal uh, consideration that, that, that uh, points out that for other models for models that are clearly more complicated and more difficult to treat from an information theoretic viewpoint, and in particular models with memory as uh, in the motion dynamics uh, of users, uh, blocking probabilities, uh, you know, blocking events and all these things, especially I would say related to millimeter waves communication where pointing beams is extremely important, uh, uh, fighting against uh, uh, you know, the, the free space isotropic propagation loss is uh, one of the fundamental issues. 
uh, uh, there is a lot of potential to incorporate sensing information to help communication and actually dramatically boost communication. So in this line of thoughts, now I putting away the, the uh, my information theorist hat and uh, I, I, I look more at Uh, so we look at the, uh, the, uh, the problem of a base station, typically operating at high frequency millimeter waves, so typically non-isotropic where propagation is directional and fighting against the path loss is uh, very important and therefore you need the beamforming gain. Uh, and then uh, we, we, we may consider two typical scenarios. Uh, in the first scenarios depicted in this uh, in this uh, cartoonish uh, uh, figure here, we have uh, unknown targets. For example, vehicles. Vehicles have a, a great advantage with respect to mobile phones. They are big metal objects, so their reflection uh, is pretty good. The base station would like to, of course, identify them, so uh, detect them and uh, uh, extract information from the backscatter uh, waveform in order, for example, to speed up uh, the initial uh, beam acquisition also. Uh, basically building side information for uh, speeding up the, the, the beam alignment uh, procedure. Um, so the main problem here is uh, target detection. And also we may uh, imagine that, the, well, the base station is not yet communicating to this unknown target. For, for, by definition, they are not yet connected, they are unknown. So it does not even know if they are there. Uh, so we may imagine that the base station is illuminating a certain angular sector uh, with uh, a wide angle beam like, like, like this, which may correspond to a control channel. So we may have uh, uh, you know, a um, uh, broadcast downlink control channel, for example, broadcasting common information to all the users. So here there are in fact, other users, imagine other users that are already connected and the base station is just sending its presence to, the, to, to in, in this area, but at the same time, uh, there will be a backscatter wave for uh, backscatter signals from these unknown uh, targets. Of course, the base station already know the known targets, so, you know, it can already use some, info, some uh, uh, side information there to do the radar detection. And this is when communication helps radar. This is not a typical radar problem where the radar is completely blind. The, the, the base station knows a lot of things about its environment, it knows already all the targets it's already communicating to. They're already connected. The base station knows it's pointing beam at them, uh, uh, knows more or less their angular position. So there are a lot of information that can be used in extracting uh, the, the uh, parameters, so detecting the unknown target and extracting and estimating the parameter. Then we have a, a second scenario where uh, the base station is already communicating with known uh, uh, targets, so uh, is already pointing independent data streams at those targets. They are being formed independent data streams. Um, but nevertheless, uh, 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 the base station wants to extract, uh, so estimate uh, parameters, for example, uh, velocity, uh, um, range, uh, and, and uh, uh, angle of arrival, uh, because, uh, it, because the communication is already taking place, uh, those parameters may serve to help beam tracking and refinement. 
Uh, so that's conceptually different from the, the, the first scenario. In the first scenario, the main problem is target detection. The question is, uh, 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 hypothesis testing, is a target there or not? Or, you know, are there multiple targets? If it is a multiple target detection problem. Here, there is no detection problem. So I'm getting very nervous when, you know, uh, people who are, you know, of course, very proficient in radar say, okay, but uh, where is the problem is detection? No, when, when the base station is already communicating to, some, to somebody, already knows that somebody is there. So there is not a detection problem anymore. This is only a problem of parameter estimation. Okay. And of course, it's a bit different because uh, when the, the base station knows that the target are there and is already communicating with them, is actually illuminating them with individual data streams that are already being formed to the target. So, of course, the signal to uh, uh, noise ratio, uh, uh, operating signal to noise ratio in this case is much higher than in this case because uh, there is, you know, isotropic. Um, so, or not really isotropic, but wide angle. So, um, here we, uh, in a previous work, we have considered like a, a subcase that can, can be actually applied to both scenario one and scenario two. Um, uh, this is the case where uh, the base station is uh, uh, using, uh, or it could, be, could, could be a base station, could be another car, but is already using uh, basically uh, um, a, a relatively narrow angle beam. And so it, it could be the case where uh, you're using beam scanning. And uh, at this point, if uh, like you know, in, in practice, uh, in, in uh, one would use these uh, rotating antennas if it is like a military radar or, or a, a avionic radar. But of course, uh, normally in this case, one would use a, a, a phase array. But uh, one can point the beam and uh, uh, and, and move it at a given angles. So it, apart from the the, the uh, discretization. Of, uh, uh, the, uh, of, of this uh, beam scanning uh, scheme, there is no uh, angle of arrival problem here. The only problem is uh, uh, target de de detection. So is there a target in this beam or not? And uh, the, the parameter estimation. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have looked uh, at uh, the case of parameter estimation. So the case uh, where uh, the position is already communicating uh, to a user in that direction. It's a sort of like preliminary, uh, preliminary approach. And uh, uh, the, the uh, channel model uh, of the uh, back scatter signal uh, is a classical multipath channel model where every path co contains a delay and a Doppler shift uh, and a coefficient. So discrete multipath uh, uh, is this frequency and time selective because you also have uh, uh, double frequency shifts. Uh, and, um, and we have considered both uh, um, OFDM modulation and uh, uh, OTFS modulation. Um, in particular, uh, so they're both linear modulation. So uh, formally, uh, the, the whole structure of, uh, uh, you know, the, the transmitter and receiver and the radar uh, parameter estimation, when it is posed in terms of maximum likelihood, is very similar. Uh, because the only difference is, well, the data will, uh, data will, um, uh, what happens? Hmm, okay. uh, the data will, um, um, somehow appear as um, uh, they will appear as a, a linear uh, in, linearly in, a, in the uh, received signal. Uh, what changes is how the parameters of interest. So in this case, uh, the path coefficients, uh, uh, Doppler and delay uh, uh, will appear inside the uh, uh, the receive signal. 
uh, and one can work out some math and at the end uh, you know not surprisingly in, in uh, the one can uh, find at the end these type of expressions where everything well the coefficients and the data are always multiplicative because it's a linear modulation and the channel is a linear system so no 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 big surprises and did the expression of these part these blocks depend on uh, uh, on the, the delay and, and doppler and this of course is modulation dependent but uh, the uh, this is absolutely not surprising uh, uh, what uh, what happens is that uh, one can can write a, a joint parameter a, a estimation estimating uh, the three times p parameters of these uh, problems. You have p multipath, and then if each 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 path component has uh, three parameters. Of course, a simultaneous maximization of the uh, uh, likelihood function or the log likelihood function uh, is uh, very heavy. So uh, what we do, uh, we can uh, do like a discretized search and, 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 uh, and iterative by, by solving for one coefficient and then replacing back. So it is essentially a, a, a generalized like ratio test, uh, as, as, as we say. Well, um, in uh, one can also work out the camera bound. Again, uh, that's a general uh, a story for, uh, for uh, uh, signals in, in Gaussian noise. Uh, it's, uh, the, the form is always the same. Um, and uh, look at the performances of uh, uh, with, uh, we, we chose uh, as other works, we chose um, uh, AO2.11p like parameters, not exact but uh, somehow the, the ranges transmit power frequencies bandwidth is uh, is, is uh, uh, fairly comparable uh, and what we see uh, in this case is uh, that uh, so this is for example is a, a velocity and range estimation so this is the uh, root mean square error for velocity and root mean square error for the range or of the for for the for the main path, um, assuming of course line of sight of the main path, uh, and 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 we see that uh, uh, both for OTFS and OFDM uh, the uh, the curves the, the these errors collapse on the camera bound uh, and and follow the camera bound over. A fairly large uh, range of signal to noise ratios. Uh, this is a signal to noise ratio at the radar receiver uh, without uh, uh, where, where you know the, the beam forming gain is already taken into account in, into the computation of this uh, signal to noise ratio because we are assuming to point a beam and, and, and both at the receiver and the transmitter. Uh, I mean, at the transmitter and the receiver, the, the radar receiver. Um, Interestingly, when we compare with the, uh, the performances with the um, radar the optimized uh, or, or design waveforms, like for example, the FMCW, which is essentially the chirp, uh, we see that the performances are identical. Uh, and uh, this is absolutely not surprising because for the same duration and bandwidth, uh, the fundamentals are there. Is uh, uh, actually uh, uh, digitally modulated signals uh, for a given duration and bandwidth are fantastic radar waveforms. They have a fantastic, uh, fantastically good ambiguity function because they are essentially like uh, very similar to white noise. So uh, uh, the, the problem is, of course, uh, the complexity of the receiver because when you have a chirp, you have you can have a very simple uh, receiver and extract uh, the same performances with uh, much less complexity. Uh, uh, for example, to one for all, you can do it very easily for duplex because the, the, the frequency of, of the transmitter and the receiver are, are always uh, different because of the chirp. But uh, when you transmit for over the whole bandwidth, then you need either two co-located by fairly far apart transmitter and receiver, or you need some full duplex uh, hardware in, in your transmitter. And in fact, I think that uh, 
If I'm not a big believer in full duplex in general, I think that the, in terms of capacity, network capacity overall is, is not a, a, a good solution. Uh, but if there is one application for full duplex, I think it's this one. Uh, it's uh, uh, if I was uh, people investing in full duplex or, or putting my you know my emphasis on full duplex, I would say this uh, joint rate and, uh, and communication is one case where the, having a full duplex uh, um, transmitter receiver at, at, at the base station side is really useful. Okay. Um, so we can see presence of multipath uh, leads to some little degradation, but not that much. So uh, and uh, uh, so basically, these are very encouraging results that uh, uh, pushes us to look at the uh, uh, generalization of the problem. And the generalization of the problem is uh, uh, what we do now if, if instead of just pointing a beam in a given direction we actually want to uh, uh, explore uh, a wider angle and uh, uh, therefore also extracting, so first of all, detecting unknown targets and uh, uh, extracting also angle, angle of arrival information. And so uh, in angle of arrival information, uh, uh, it, there is an interesting thing here is that well, array processing has been there for, a while, uh, for, for forever, and uh, we know exactly how to do angle of arrival uh, with the array, array processing, even at high frequencies, it is, it's perfectly done, but it is done with uh, uh, waveforms that are essentially narrowband, um, for example, the chip. And if the waveform is a narrowband, then we can sample every antenna, we can demodulate and sample, we can have a full, uh, fully digital array processing, uh, uh, and this is uh, has been done uh, more or less forever. With communication waveform at millimeter waves, uh, well, the bandwidth of the of, of the signal is is uh, uh, very large, and we know that sampling uh, these signals, uh, sampling every antenna, uh, and going to uh, basement. It is very expensive. Uh, so if we have one gigahertz of bandwidth and, and you have 64 antennas and you want to sample them, uh, so demodulate and sample or direct RF, whatever you want to do, it is a lot of uh, 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 bit per, per, per second. And uh, basically this becomes uh, incompatible with uh, the um, power consumption of, of these front ends, especially if it is inter, uh, an integrated uh, uh, hardware. Uh, the, for example, the, um, um, the heat, uh, just uh, uh, this would melt you know, your, your, your chip very, very easily. So, um, and of course, people talk about even larger arrays, so uh, 64, but it could be like uh, hundreds. <laughs> um, so a popular uh, approach for millimeter waves, of course, is uh, the hybrid uh, digital analog beam forming, where uh, we concatenate uh, a digital basement processor with a limited number of RF chains uh, 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 with uh, a, uh, um, let's say, um, configurable uh, beamforming array in uh, that works in the RF domain. So the problem with this uh, uh, architecture in terms of radar uh, uh, detection is that we have a very large dimensionality reduction. For example, here we may have eight RF chains and here maybe we have, I don't know, 128. So this is sort of this fun dimensionality funnel means that we simply cannot directly sample all these antennas. We have to somehow project from dimension 128 to dimension 8 and sample this dimension 8. So this is an ideal scenario for, um, let's say, what, say, very broadly speaking, compressed sensing. This is a paramount example of, of, of compressed sensing. Of course, you know, the, the way the problem has been posed mathematically, uh, the traditional complex sensing uh, is all discrete, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here we are, we are looking at uh, 
more like a super resolution if we talk about uh, uh, angle of arrivals and a uh, delay of Doppler in, in the continuous uh, domain. So it is like a off the grid compressed sensing problem, but it is fundamentally a compressed sensing problem. So uh, what we can do here is to design these sensing matrix because this transformation, this, uh, this uh, projection from uh, the antenna domain to the our, say RF chain domain or beam domain, some people call it the beam, beam space representation, is uh, indeed a, a, a projection is exactly what the sensing matrix in compressed sensing does. So uh, the challenge is to design these uh, uh, beam, so this, 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 this uh, um, sensing matrix uh, and uh, you know, what we want to do intuitively is to provide a good uh, uh, sampling of the angle domain, right? Uh, and and uh, uh, sampling the angle domain because what, uh, what we want to estimate typically is quite, uh, is quite uh, uh, sparse. So there will be a few direction of arrival let's say the, the line of sight path of the backscatter uh, channel from uh, signal from, from, uh, from the targets. And so uh, uh, we have a fairly sparse uh, 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 signal in the angle domain. And we know that if, uh, uh, if we want if to estimate something that is sparse in one domain, we have to do essentially random sampling uh, so random projection and look at the dual domain and dual domain will be of course the, the, the beam space domain but random projections means also that using for example a, a roster of uh, uh, of beams like like in, in this figure is not a very good idea because this would be you know uh, regular sampling in the angle domain you never want to sample uh, like uh, uh, uniformly and regularly uh, something in the same domain in which that something that you want to estimate is sparse. You want to take random projections. So more, most likely one would design, uh, you know, a set of beam forming pattern that will uh, have some strange uh, shapes, right? And then uh, uh, in order to trade off the uh, ability of exploring the angle domain with the ability of having some beam forming gain in some directions. Uh, and uh, so this is an interesting uh, open problem that uh, we have not really solved, also because we know that from the theory of compressed sensing that uh, 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 deterministic, so the design of deterministic sensing matrices is one of the most difficult problems in, in compressed sensing. Every, almost all the results uh, are, are stated for ensemble of random matrices and they hold uh, with overwhelming high probability. So for example, using pseudo-random beam forming patterns uh, with some criteria may be a good idea. Anyway, assuming that we can do this, uh, uh, the, the, the channel model now is uh, uh, a little bit different because now we have a, uh, a signal that is uh, transmitted. So in the case of uh, say scenario one, when we transmit just one wide angle beacon, well, there is only one data stream and then this F uh, which is the transmitter is just one column. If we are sending uh, beamform data streams in scenario two, then F will be uh, several columns, so one beamforming uh, column for each, for each data stream. And then we have these projection matrix here, which operate this dimensionality reduction from the, the this is the steering, uh, steering uh, vector of, of the array in, uh, in direction of phi P. And, uh, uh, and, and this matrix operates this dimensionality reduction from the antenna domain to the beam space domain. Anyway, what we obtain is a, is a vector observation. And then of course we can do whatever we want. For example, we can do maximum likelihood detection. And now we have four P parameters. If we have P targets, uh, 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 we have you know, four parameters. Uh, so the uh, compressed amplitude, uh, uh, the angle of arrival, the uh, Doppler, uh, and the delay for each band. So we have done this. Uh, of course, it be, uh, this becomes a, 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 an interesting, um, an interesting uh, problem uh, because uh, you know the maximization of the likelihood function in this case becomes even more complicated. In addition, there are uh, 
uh, is an unknown number of targets. Uh, so you also want to do uh, uh, target detection. And uh, 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 so we have developed a, a, a core search, then some refinement, the super resolution refinement, and some uh, uh, also uh, uh, success interference cancellation to uh, prevent you know, the, uh, the shadowing of one target uh, against another. And so, for example, these are uh, results uh, where uh, we have considered, in this case, this is the detection of a single target. And uh, uh, depending on the uh, width of the, uh, of the transmit beam, we see that the detection probability uh, uh, collapses after a certain distance. And this depends, of course, on the beamforming gain, because the transmit power is always the same, but the beamforming gain is different. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, uh, velocity and uh, range and angle of arrival estimated um, conditioning on detecting the target, and uh, in, of course, uh, so in the range where where the uh, probability of detection is relatively large, uh, and uh, we can see that the, these uh, follow the corresponding Kramer-Rao bounds uh, very very closely. Uh, this is also for uh, OTS, uh, OTFS modulation. Uh, this is another experiment where we consider uh, one uh, target that uh, is fixed and we move another target in a relatively narrow angle. So moving this other target, of course, as this is the second tar target uh, be become farther and farther apart, the, the, the risk is, uh, is going to be obscured and obstructed by the, the, the fixed target, which is very close. So here we, uh, we look at, for example, the, the te target detection probability for the second target, which is this curve, uh, and uh, uh, compared with the case where there is a single target, which is the previous curve for the, for the same uh, beam width. And we see that uh, up to a certain point, up to a certain distance. So the, in this case, this, this car here is at 10 meters. So it's very close. And we start uh, basically, uh, we can uh, detect the, the other, and, and the width here is 10 degree. Uh, uh, so uh, we have a relatively uh, uh, narrow angle and we can detect the, 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 the second target up to uh, you know, 90 meter distance. Uh, uh, the probability of detection of the second target is close to one. Um, and this is thanks to the uh, successive interference cancellation feature of, of, of this detector, because otherwise uh, this would be completely ob ob obstructed by the, by the first target. For the uh, second scenario, uh, this is just a reminder of what the second scenario is. So we have individual being formed streams. So of course, in this case, uh, well, uh, we are only interested in uh, uh, parameter estimation because uh, we already know that the, the targets are there. And uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, all the estimators, in particular uh, range and, and velocity, uh, they have this typical waterfall behavior. So they follow the camera bound up to a certain point, And then when uh, uh, the distance is, uh, is too much, so the, the single translation is not enough, we have this transition, so the waterfall transition where the, the estimator uh, uh, deviates significantly from the camera bound. Uh, there is a little bit of an exception in uh, angle estimation because, of course, because of the fact that, uh, that these are already being formed, so there is uh, uh, already some a priori information on the angle, which means that the, the angle error will never be larger than the width of the beam. So that's why we have this sort of saturation here in, in this part. And also, also you can see that uh, uh, the, uh, depending on the number of antennas and therefore the, the beam forming gain, the, uh, uh, the, the, the range uh, in, uh, so the, the, the performance versus the distance uh, can be, uh, of course, uh, uh, increased. Uh, and this is just because uh, we have a larger beamforming gain for the same transient power. Um, okay, I have uh, now a little time, it's a very little time. I want just to mention uh, an application. So the application would be beam refinement and tracking. So first of all, what is beam alignment? Beam alignment is the problem that uh, 
at millimeter waves, uh, a mobile station may not even see that there is uh, a base a millimeter waves base station, even if they are very close, if the beams are not aligned, simply because the, uh, the, the, the link budget must be close, must be, must be uh, above a certain uh, threshold, and typically you need at least one one sided and most of the time two sided beam forming so to have the, the combined informing gain of transmitter and receiver in order to close the link and bring the after beam forming signal to noise ratio uh, above a threshold for example zero db if you can communicate a zero db with a capacity achieving code you can communicate a one bit per second per hertz one one gigahertz of bandwidth you have one your one gigabit per second link right there so basically bringing the signal to noise ratio from like minus 20 minus 30 db 20 to 30 combined informing gain is the goal of uh, all these type of systems um the problem is how you do the the, the alignment of the beams before you know, when you are working at minus 30 dB, when you are working at minus 30 dB, is very, uh, the problem is very difficult. So there are, of course, schemes, uh, schemes based on protocols, like, for example, beam scanning uh, and, and feedback. Send, uh, so the base station uh, sends, uh, uh, scans some beams, uh, the user listen, and then will transmit the index of its best beam, provided that this transmission in the, in the reverse direction can be done at very low rate. Uh, and of course, we have you know a lot of results that indicates uh, with simulations and measurements that uh, at high frequencies these channels are quite sparse in the angle delay domain. Uh, in general, in the angle Doppler delay domain, we have also developed uh, uh, generalized beam scanning schemes that uh, uh, for which both transmitter and receiver explore simultaneously several direction a little bit in in the in the uh, vein of this projection matrix that I was uh, uh, talking before, and then one can uh, solve a compressed sensing type of problem uh, uh, that is completely non-coherent, just in power measurement, so it, it is robust to Doppler frequency also. It, it's really like a, something that has to happen before communication. So. Uh, uh, even timing is a, is, a, is is a problem here, but it works well. At the, uh, so we can assume that uh, after these beam form, the, these uh, beam alignment procedures that are mainly based on protocols, uh, we have a situation where uh, a user is assigned uh, a beam, uh, and this beam is one out of uh, uh, this. perfect it will never be exactly at the center of the beam so there is some initial alignment error simply because these beams have some tolerances so then the uh, we can uh, use for example the radar information the, uh, uh, in, in order to do beam refinement for example uh, in this case uh, uh, we have looked at the, uh, at the problem of designing uh, now this matrix such that it is relatively pointy so we use in fact the uh, uh, the eigen vectors the uh, we have nrf uh, uh, rf chain so we take the nrf uh, dominant eigen vectors of the uh, covariance matrix of uh, um, induced by the uh, say the uh, line of sight propagation in a, in a range of directions that uh, around the the uh, the broad side so minus beta pi plus beta pi where beta is uh, a, a design parameter and typically is a bit larger than the resolution uh, one over number of antennas uh, of the array um, so these sequences, these eigenvectors, are called the Slepian sequences and are well known in, in beam forming. They, they uh, create a top, if you take NRF of those, provided NRF is uh, less than beta times uh, NA, those are uh, uh, unitary, uh, mutually orthogonal uh, uh, vectors, and therefore they create a, a tall unitary matrix. Then we apply a, 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 
a phase shift, so a, a beam steering. So in order to look in the direction of the nominal angle, so it will look in this, it will be phi hat. So in this way, uh, we, we can obtain a vector observation to extract angle information. And so this is, for example, yeah, these are radiation patterns of the first uh, one to three sleeping sequences for the case of 64 antennas. Um, and we can use simply uh, good old music to get uh, uh, the, the angle of arrival from this vector information um, by simply collecting enough samples and constructing a sample covariance matrix. And of course, we can also use the maximum likelihood approach as before. Uh, informing this is uh, one bit so basically this would be the threshold of a scenario before being forming for this uh, number of antennas i think this is 64 antennas for which we can get our bit per second per hertz and now you can see this dash curve uh, curves corresponds to uh, pointing arrows of 0 0.5 degree 1 degree and 1.5 degree and you see that if the pointing arrow is 1.5 degree in this case well, we are very, very uh, uh, far from our target. And in fact, we are uh, we are going to get here. So this is almost 10, is, is almost 10 dB of uh, is 10 dB of, of, of gap. Okay, but if we can do beam, uh, beam refinement, uh, in fact, uh, we will get uh, uh, in, in this case we will get this yellow curve here. So basically, we can recover in this case 5 dB. Uh, of gap, which is uh, uh, which is uh, quite good, and in the case where the initial error is uh, is a one degree, we can recover like uh, about three dB. Of course, if the initial error is very small, like a zero point five uh, degree, well, there is nothing to recover, and 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 in fact, we see that uh, in the interesting region, uh, basically, uh, well, the, in this case, there is nothing to do. Uh, but that's an example of uh, how this uh, uh, radar information would help for free and give you like a 5 dB gain uh, uh, with respect to uh, to the case where uh, the beams are not refined. Um, another example is in uh, beam tracking when there is motion. So when there is motion, of course, one can extract this radar information and uh, uh, and this gives you know uh, repeated measurements. So we have a, a sequence, a time, a time series of noisy measurements uh, with the, the parameters, of course, uh, our angle of arrival, the velocity, and, and range. Then we could put them into uh, a tracker, uh, and the tracker, uh, well, it can can be done using standard Bayesian uh, statistical inference. For example, it can be according to a certain uh, model, for example, uh, if we make uh, like a, a Gauss-Markov uh, uh, model, we would use a Kalman filter. If we make like a, something that is non-linear or, or discrete, uh, uh, and we, we we consider like a hidden Markov model for the mobility, then we will use basically the forward recursion of a, a BCJR algorithm, which is the optimal optimal predictor. Uh, uh, for a uh, hidden mark of uh, uh, models, but because um, uh, you know because machine learning is inflation and and uh, because especially because uh, uh, this would be a, a quite ideal application of machine learning because uh, mobility models are complicated uh, and uh, in general. Uh, we don't have a very good statistical description of mobility models, even if uh, when we have, it's still uh, always an approximation of, of reality. So why not simply learning the, uh, the models implicitly? And so uh, uh, in this case, one would use a recursive uh, uh, deep neural network. And in particular, we have considered uh, bidirectional long short-term memory uh, networks uh, and so uh, what happens, for example, for even a relatively complicated mobility model where uh, this is a simulation where the path loss is, uh, uh, is and, and the scattering is obtained by the simulator quadriga and we have a trajectory that uh, so uh, like a, 
a rectilinear trajectory and then uh, it, it becomes a, like a circle. Imagine a car moving along a way and then uh, getting into a roundabout, uh, which is typical in Berlin, by the way. There is a Grosserstermer in the middle of uh, the, the Tier Garden, which is the central park of Berlin, is a gigantic roundabout. So in this case, uh, uh, the, the, the network would learn uh, these uh, statistics and uh, uh, incorporate, uh, uh, basically learn the, 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 uh, the, pre the prediction model um, in order to and, uh, uh, basically do whatever your favorite particle filter or uh, 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 extended common filter would do. So this is a simulation for that, for that particular dynamics where uh, we have an Oracle uh, prediction, uh, which is this, uh, this blue that gives uh, the perfect uh, uh, position and therefore the perfect uh, pointing of, of, of the beam. Uh, the, the red one is what the recursive neural network gives, and the, and the, the, the green one is a, a particle filter. So the, uh, I, I, I don't want to make like a general statement here because we are very far from, from, from this, but I would say that uh, the, uh, uh, this type of uh, inference where uh, the statistical models are actually pretty either complicated or also unknown or imprecise or partially known. This is an ideal, uh, say, playground where learning implicitly the models directly from, uh, from the data using, using therefore, uh, uh, for example, uh, supervised uh, uh, learning is, uh, uh, can give, of course, very good performances. And, um, and in this case, uh, it seems that uh, this recursive neural network, which implicitly track the dynamics of, some, of, a, of a complicated dynamic process, seem to be the right structure to do uh, this type of tracking. OK, so we get to a conclusion where, uh, what can I say? Uh, I, I think that uh, um, it is pretty clear that this uh, add-on feature uh, of uh, sensing can help uh, communication. Uh, of course, it may also be uh, the, op the, the other way around, that uh, communication can help sensing. For example, we have just seen a very, very, very tiny example. If you already know that you are communicating with an object, you don't need to detect it. And if you already know that you're pointing a, a beam in that direction, the, the uh, angle uh, of arrival estimation cannot be more than the, the width of the beam. So uh, uh, you have already uh, a, a pretty, pretty uh, well, uh, a good idea of, of what the angle of arrival will be. So anyway, uh, it seems that the, the major problem of uh, uh, sensing with the digital modulated waveforms is the complexity of the receiver simply because it has a wide band and uh, uh, and therefore we need uh, either uh, two collocated uh, arrays and a, a transmitting receiver or a full duplex uh, uh, processing that's an ideal uh, uh, The receiver knows exactly what uh, it was transmitted. So this means that, that uh, uh, one has very large blocks provided that one can sample and, memory, and, and put in memory and process uh, uh, very large blocks of, of, of data. So the, the, the um, let's say, uh, frequency resolution, uh, it can be very high because you have a long frame at your disposal. The, the, the delay resolution can be very high because you have a very large bandwidth. Uh, and of course, uh, using these uh, uh, tricks of uh, uh, projecting a large array into a small dimensional uh, uh, RF uh, chains, uh, so beam space domain representation and designing carefully these projecting matrices, one can also have a very good angle uh, resolution and accuracy. Um, so this is just a little bibliography to uh, some of our recent works. Of course, there are a lot of more parallel works. It's a very uh, alive field. That's why we are here. That's why uh, there is this initiative. And I would like to thank you for your attention. 
Okay, thanks, Giuseppe. And uh, we have received uh, lots of questions regarding your wonderful presentation. And I have uh, collected some of them and I'll ask the questioners to um, ask uh, the question by themselves. So I think the first uh, question is from, uh, uh, from Dr. Ahmad Nim Nimmer. So uh, Ahmad, can you please unmute yourself? So he has a question about uh, the uh, OTFS. Yes. Ahmad? Hi, Ahmad, can you hear us? Hello? Yes, yes, uh, I hear you, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, my question is about uh, OTFS. So uh, we heard a lot about OTFS, but uh, if I look uh, carefully at the, the signal processing part related to OTFS, so I see that uh, the main uh, advantage that is using uh, 2D block, that means some, some <clears throat> signal spread it over frequency and time. So what, what is really the speciality of OTFS? Why we, we cannot just simply use any uh, 2D block instead of saying it is OTFS? Right. So uh, of course, I probably have a partial view on this. Um, I have always been very skeptical about OTFS. Uh, but, but then uh, start working with, the, in particular, one of the PhD students, and uh, we made some papers and read uh, many papers from other groups, I have uh, a little bit changed my mind. So from a communication viewpoint, um, of course, OTFS has uh, one, one uh, interesting feature uh, is that uh, somehow, you know, if the channel is uh, effectively sparse in the delay Doppler domain. So it is of the form that we have seen in this presentation as sum of discrete multipath, each of which ha has a delay and a Doppler uh, shift. Uh, turns out that the channel estimation becomes very simple. Uh, basically, you just send uh, one symbol in, a, in a, surrounded by many zeros in the Doppler delay domain. This symbol will shift, will be scattered into into this uh, uh, the position of uh, or this multipath because there are zero all around. After all the transform, it's easy to estimate those components. And now, imagine for example a, ch a channel that has only two paths. Like which is pretty typical in millimeter waves. You have a line of sight and one reflection. Typically, it's the ground reflection, but it could be like a wall or, or, or a bus or a metal plate, something. The rest you can neglect because uh, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, attenuated so much, right? Uh, in addition, when you have the informing at both sides, you, many of the multipath uh, disappears because it's simply filtered out by it. But now imagine this. So we have two paths. And there is a big difference in the Doppler uh, shifts. So this channel, by, uh, by uh, if you see this in the time frequency domain as a transfer function, is a terrible channel. It's very frequency selective and very time selective. Our typical OFDM structure that puts the pilots in, in, a, in a line, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of combo frequencies at some point, will collapse. You have a time variation across a single block, okay? Um, because the, it's, it's very fast. Uh, however, in the Doppler delay domain, these are four coefficients. Once you have four coefficients, you know the channel for, in principle, an unlimited amount of symbols. You can have huge blocks and still, don't have to re-estimate the channel all the time. In fact, the size of the block depends on when this parameter changed. Of course, if uh, you have a mobile uh, scenario, the, also the Doppler and the delay will change with time, but at a much, much, much lower pace than 
the channel transfer function when you see this as a, as a, as a time varying transfer function. So uh, you can afford a, a very, very small pilot overhead. The only thing that limits the size of the blocks is complexity. And then we have also a paper where we have considered a, a message passing, low complexity receiver. And then we have com uh, compared this uh, for effect for actual channel FDM. And OFDM in this case, because the channel changes in a, in a single frame, you have to spread out the, 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 uh, the, the, the symbols all around your block. And then you have to do uh, MMSC time frequency interpolation. Now, when, when you take all this into account, it's so complicated to estimate the channel and interpolate it over time frequency for, for a, a rapidly varying channel that at the end, even the OFDM receiver is not so simple anymore. And in fact, it turns out that. Uh, uh, that they are pretty comparable in terms of complexity. They are both linear in, in the block size. And when you look at the fact that one OTM has a one CP per symbol, while, while, while OTFS has one CP per block, you have all these things that put together, you see that in fact o OTFS outperforms o o OFTM. Uh, complexity is similar, but you have to be care, uh, clever and use a, a, a low complexity message passing receiver with a soft output. And uh, uh, the, the, the overhead, the pilot overhead is much less and also the CP overhead. So overall included, uh, I was like prevented from, against OTFS, but I have to say, if just for a communication uh, viewpoint, uh, it is, uh, it can be convenient in the case where the channel is very sparse and the Doppler, uh, the Doppler spread, the Doppler difference between, between uh, the multiple is very large. In other cases, of course not. If you have a nice channel that is like a diffuse scattering and uh, uh, mobility is limited, absolutely not. I will never use OTFS, I will use OFDM because this is the channel estimation and the, and the receiver are so much simpler in this case. Uh, you do like a block fading is constant over each block and everything was fine. And this is why we use, a, 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 you know, after researching for years and years uh, in, uh, in preparation of 5G new waveforms, then people realize that the new waveforms are the old waveforms because we are still stuck with the uh, cyclic prefix OFDM, which is great uh, because it's really in, that, in those conditions, it's almost unbeatable in terms of complexity and, and performances. Okay, thank you, Professor Kerr. And uh, uh, Ahmad, do you have any other comments or I can? Um, yes, actually, um, I still regarding the uh, comparison between uh, OFTM and OTFS. So OFTM is, uh, is somehow, if we look at OFTM, it's just sending one, uh, uh, one symbol and trying to estimate the, the channel from there. Yes, but OTFS actually uh, is nothing but uh, some uh, encoding over a group of OFDM symbols. So the, the encoding there over time or the recording over time is, is again DFT. But do we really need DFT? What, for instance, if we use another uh, unitary matrix, like uh, we, are, we are talking about complexity, for instance, uh, using Hadamard matrix, which is less complex than uh, DFT. So I think um, we could get, again, the same performance as uh, OTFS. Probably, um, probably it's a, at the end you have to look at the uh, you know performance versus complexity versus pilot overhead in the case of a uh, of a time varying channel, and uh, OTFS is an idea is uh, using FFTs. Uh, uh, you can use other transforms and see what happens. I absolutely why why not? Thank you very much. As long as as long as the, the comparison is well done and is really and to uh, f uh, find shortcuts like uh, you know say oh let's assume that the frequency the Doppler shifts are integer multiple of these oh let's assume that the multipath uh, the delays are integer multiple of that of course then everything is easy everything is low complexity and uh, but uh, no 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 you have to, one has to do the right thing uh, uh, use the right models. And, and then, uh, uh, and also for the channel estimation, include because you don't know the channel, 
uh, a, a, which means also, you know, how much uh, uh, pilot overhead you need to estimate the channel at a certain level of accuracy, such that your coherent receiver, whatever receiver you're going to use, gives the performance you, you want. And then you have the real comparison. And uh, of course, there is no theorem that says that OTFS is optimal. I mean, it's one. Uh, as a, the only the only thing I know is that for a, for a linear time invariant channel, OFDM is near optimal. Because this is a Shannon water filling, and this is a, comes directly from from information theory. But for a time varying channel, a random varying channel like a filling channel, there are so many models, and uh, that uh, who knows. Okay, thank you, thank, very much. thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Joseph. Yeah. And uh, um, another question also regarding OTFS. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, please go ahead. Um, yeah. So my question was uh, related to the previous question. Um, so I know that FMCW can offer some specific advantages in terms of sensing compared to OFDM, like full duplex or uh, the limited ADC bandwidth. Um, does OTFS offer any advantage in, in terms of sensing? I'm asking because I also saw the results that Professor Kaira presented and basically the performance was almost the same or even slightly worse. And uh, I have a second question regarding to the previous answer um, regarding the channel estimation part. Uh, there was a comparison with OFDM and, and interpolated uh, um, channel estimates over the subcarriers. What, what, if, what if we compare with parametric channel estimation with OFDM? Does well, um, okay. Now there are several questions uh, to which I don't have an answer because they are very specific, and uh, if uh, they, they don't, uh, they you know I don't know everything. Of course, I only know what I, what I know. Um, I would say uh, related to your first question, in terms of same thing, uh, uh, OTFS and OFDM. Any, I would say, I, I want to, you know, say it like a, a, a blunt statement. Any signal with the same duration and the same bandwidth that looks sufficiently random, so it looks like when it, when you look at a time domain, it looks like random noise, uh, because it's perfectly known at the receiver. In this case, you don't have to estimate anything. Uh, it, there, there are no like everything is pilot, so you, you know exactly what you send, right? Uh, would have the same, roughly the same performances in terms of estimation. And the fundamental point is, uh, you know, uh, think of this in terms of ambiguity function. If you have a, a, a wide band signal over a certain amount of time, more or less your ambiguity function, it looks like something extremely concentrated where the concentration in frequency is the inverse of the duration in time. The concentration in time is the inverse of, of the bandwidth, and that's it. So this is uh, uh, this tells you that uh, any any uh, digital modulation that is not like completely stupid that is using all its dimensions and those modulations like OFTM or TFS they use essentially all the dimensions. Uh, with OFTM you may argue that the cyclic prefix introduces some cyclostationarity, uh, so uh, you know, is not uh, there is an overhead there, so it's not really using all the dimensions. With uh, OTFS because of course at the price of a uh, uh, but you know, you do like filter bank of the end without the cyclic prefix, and you would uh, get exactly the same performances. Uh, I mean, exactly is not, not true. You will get essentially the same performances um, so in terms of sensing. Now, the second question was uh, uh, what about using a parametric channel estimation? Of course, I mean, uh, if you use a parametric channel estimator, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, for uh, FDM, you would have the same type of advantages. That uh, if the channel depends on four parameters, uh, even if uh, like uh, as, a, as an impulse response or a transfer function changes very rapidly, but it still depends on four parameters. If you uh, estimate, the problem is uh, uh, in which format it's easy to estimate those parameters, right? And, uh, and at the end. Uh, you know, it seems that the uh, OTFS, uh, because of the file structure that you can, you can construct, that gives a, a little bit uh, easier way, because the way you plug the, you know, at the end you have to plug this, the, the pilot somewhere. 
you don't plug the if you plug the pilot in the time frequency you have a structure if you plug the pilots in a, in a Doppler delay you have another structure so I, I but of course you know if the, if the shell estimation is similar it seems to me that for a channel that is sparse in the Doppler delay domain uh, it is somehow uh, nice uh, or, or somehow fits the, 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 the sparsity of the channel the, to, to, to somehow work in the domain, but uh, you may be wrong. I don't know. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anastasius, and thank you, Julia. And uh, another question from Professor An Liu. So he, so go ahead, please go ahead, Anne. Hello, Professor Joseph. Haven't seen you for a long Hi. time. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. I hope everything is fine with you. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Anyway, my question is that uh, as you have many application waveforms such as OFDM or OTF to realize radar sensing at the base station, then it seems that we need a full duplex uh, base station, right? Uh, however, most works on joint communication and radar sensing has ignored current full duplex technology power enough to support accurate radar sensing. So can we uh, continue to ignore this issue uh, in the future work? Well, I can only tell you that this is a problem that seems to And everybody says, oh, assume we can receive and transmit at the same time. Because uh, on one hand, uh, communication is continuous. Well, yes, there are guard intervals, but they are not like uh, you don't transmit pulses and then silence, pulses and silence. Then if you have a chair that uh, shifts in frequency, what comes back is a different frequency of what, what was sent. You have two filters following the transmit and the receiver. You but you can uh, separate them in, in, uh, by, by these two filters and, uh, and uh, then you can sample, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why uh, radar receivers can be all digital, even if you have an array and, and, uh, uh, and they work very well. I mean, automotive radars work like this and, and they have digital arrays and they work. But uh, uh, the uh, problem here is that uh, uh, with the wideband signal that is con essentially continuous in time because uh, the communication waveform uh, does not stay idle for for, for time, uh, it's uh, the full duplex or at least to have a co-located. So uh, something may may not be full duplex. You, you can also do full duplex with like two separate arrays. You can have uh, you know your your radar array as long as you have a uh, calibration. So somehow they look in the same direction they have the same angular reference uh, uh, you can have two different arrays and have them you know uh, separate uh, such that you know the, the signal that is re-injected the cro cross talk between transmitter and receiver is not uh, saturating the, 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 the receiver front end but uh, it is definitely something that, that should be studied uh, more more closely maybe there are uh, works that uh, address specifically this, this uh, problem but uh, i haven't seen them very uh, so it looks like a full duplex in a certain sense for radar is a done deal because of the because the way the system is designed but uh, to use wideband uh, digitally modulated signals is uh, probably one of the major hurdles in practice okay i see thank you and uh, i have another question actually uh, it's uh, Related about the accuracy of radar sensing, uh, because you have talked about using radar sensing to aid the communication, right? And the basic idea is to first estimate the location of the mobile user using this radar sensing technology, and then we can uh, we can obtain some information about the live side channel, and then we can use this to do beamforming or something like that, right? Uh, but my problem is that because the radar echo signal usually has no SNR than the downlink signal or the uplink signal, right? Then is the uh, radar sensing accuracy enough to add the, uh, the estimation of the communication channel? Especially for this, you know, millimeter wave and massive memory channel, they may have very large uh, beam. If the operation is not very accurate, then it may not help the, uh, to add the communication, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you can see, for example, just for us, 
a simple example. In this beam refinement, uh, it's so messy that uh, it's impossible to see, but let me erase this. Uh, in this beam uh, refinement case, you can see very clearly that uh, uh, the refinement based on angle of arrival starts working. You know, for example, take this curve, this is with refinement and this is fixed. They start working here where there is a crossover. But in fact, you start being interested more or less in this region because more maybe we, we, you know, we, we want this target of one bit per second per hertz. It's just, you know, it could be one bit, could be half a bit, but okay, this is more or less what we want. Uh, it could be more. If it is more, well, of course, if it's two bits, of course, the gain is larger. But uh, this is to say, there is a region in which uh, your um, uh, estimation is so bad that it's not helping in this case. Of course, this is a very uh, kind of preliminary result because you have also to take into account that you don't have just one estimation. This is a one-shot problem, right? But in fact, the angle does not change so fast. You have thousands of slots with roughly the same angle. So what about you put them into a denoiser? What about you, you put them into a tracker, into a Kalman filter or something like that? So of course you are accumulating many, 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 many measurements. And you know, if you have a thousand measurements that you get right, right there, you have 30 dB gain. So <laughs> when you have 30 dB gain, uh, then your minus 30 becomes zero. So you're going to operate in it. So it, it, it's really, it really depends on the, the uh, range of variation. Uh, uh, you know, these, these parameters typically change at a speed, which is uh, uh, at a rate, which is much, much lower than the rate of communication. Here, if you, you have a one gigahertz of bandwidth, you send so many frames. <laughs> Before the angle has changed significantly, you have a really thousand of blocks. So uh, with a nice tracker, a nice denoiser, just you know, just a Kalman filter would would do miracles here. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, I think that uh, one has always to qualify the problem and define really well the conditions. So sometimes people get you know in law with one thing and but don't think uh, is this actually relevant for the system i want to consider is it the, the, the best i can do this fantastic compressing algorithm i want to apply it at all costs but uh, if you reverse the problem and you look at the problem first maybe there are other things to do and and, and those you know loss in autonomous ratio yes in one shot is absolutely very low but when you integrate over one, uh, let's say a hundred blocks, you have a twenty dB gain right there, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you. Our uh, final question from uh, Professor Jing Hongyuan. So, uh, Professor Yuan, can you please unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes. thank you. Okay, thank you. Hi, Joseph. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, very impressive talk. It's uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, I just saw your um, detection performance on OFDM and OTFS and uh, yes. uh, quite similar. I think that's understandable. Just wondering, do you have any uh, um, uh, any insight or result on the complexity issue on the detection for these two different signals? Yeah, uh, so I don't want to say something totally stupid here because, uh, uh, but I, I think that the overall, uh, and frequency so delays stays inside the cyclic prefix of OFDM and uh, the uh, free the Doppler shifts are significantly less than the inter carrier spacing and normally I would say 99.9999 percent of the cases we are in those cases then the uh, uh, OFDM, even for this type of uh, parameter estimation, is uh, significantly simpler. Uh, 
Uh, and the reason is that uh, uh, when, for example, you have a Doppler shift, which is, I don't know, let's say, let's say 1000, 1000 Hertz. Okay, one kilohertz is a, is a very large Doppler shift, but your, your spacing is 15 kilohertz or maybe more. It depends on which frequency, maybe it's 150 kilohertz if you go a factor of 10. Uh, so uh, they, they, basically the intercalar interference is, a, is a essentially negligible. Basically, you, you're going to have a very simplified, and if the delay is stays inside the, the circuit prefix, at the end, you, you end up with something that is, uh, uh, you know, is a, essentially OFDM by the books. And when you have OFDM by the books, so you have uh, also a much simpler structure to, to deal with. In general, this is not true because when you have intercalar interference and intersymbol interference, then also the FDM receiver has to consider the whole block. And then if you consider the whole block of n times m, you have like n, n subcarriers and n symbols in time, the complexity is pretty much the same. But these blocks, is, uh, when you look at this, in other words, when you look at this linear model and say, oh, it's a linear model, it's simple, yes. Uh, but uh, with OFDM, most of the time, these linear models are diagonal matrices. <laughs> they multiply your symbols. And, uh, and, and, and these diagonal matrices have a nice chronic structure that you can exploit. It, while for, for OTFS, those are full matrices, and, uh, and, uh, and you have to really consider the whole block. So I would say that, yes, it's a, a OFDM is a, it gives a lower complexity also for the, for the parameter estimation case. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. But on the other hand, if you're in the simple, in the, I mean, in the carry interference is very, very small. You probably uh, yeah, rely on the time frequency domain estimation. And uh, it is a small, it might be difficult to detect the, the Doppler accurately. Does that make sense? <laughs> or for OTFS, you probably have the freedom to play with the different domains, like you can play with the delay Doppler domain and the time frequency domain, or even time domain. The, so I, I think uh, there might be some complexity issue uh, uh, um, may need to be considered, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, so uh, this was, not very much our, our experience here. So it was a, a priori, we couldn't predict that uh, the performances in terms of estimation error for this, uh, say, Doppler delay uh, would be so similar and would be almost indistinguishable with respect to uh, the FM uh, uh, CW and uh, uh, also would collapse on the camera bound essentially the same signal to noise ratio. So it, it was kind of uh, a priori kind of surprising because when you see, you look at the formula, you look at the, uh, 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 they, they are quite different. Uh, so it was a little bit, for, for me, it is a surprise that they perform so similarly. Um, and by the way, those results are obtained uh, for the OFDM case, are really obtained for realistic numbers and therefore the Doppler shifts are, uh, fairly smaller mm -hmm. than uh, the intercalar interference. Uh, so um, we have uh, used, uh, say, a receiver that assumes no intercalar interference, although uh, there is in the model. The, the, the model is not like, the model is exact, but the receiver is neglecting a lot of things. But, the, but what the, the receiver is neglecting is a very, very small. So we are in these conditions. So, uh, so it was a kind of, a, Strange or, or strange, or maybe it's not strange. Uh, it, it maybe it's expected, but it certainly is not something that I would have said a priori that one that they, all these fairly different signal from were so similar. At the end. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. If you based on the time frequency domain to do signal processing, probably they achieve the similar band because that is uh, what you can do the best. Uh, yeah. I think the probably. Uh, or I, I just uh, wondering, your detection probably is also in time frequency domain rather than delay Doppler domain. If you do delay Doppler domain, might be have some uh, complexity reduction. I'm not quite sure. Just uh, ask. Yeah. Uh, the the OF, the OTFS uh, estimator uh, work. Uh, I mean, the search 
Well, so the light function is a function of tau and, and nu. So the, the yeah. delay in, 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 in Doppler. So the search is done by discretizing this domain and looking at the peaks of the of the of the likelihood function and then uh, doing a local search. So it's really in the Doppler delay. We, we, so in other words, the, the, these algorithms really, uh, really consider the channel uh, in parametric form and, and look at the parameters of the, of the channel in the Doppler delay domain. Okay, um, thank you. Mm. Okay, thank you, Professor Yuan, and uh, thank okay. you, Joseph. I think uh, that'll be all the questions and uh, we have uh so many questions and uh, exciting discussions so thank you for today's presentation and uh, i would like to uh sorry giuseppe can you please stop sharing your screen and uh, yes yes sure yeah, yeah. okay yes yeah, so so um i would like to uh so this is a preview of our next uh, seminar which will be given by uh Professor Yunina Elda from Wiesma Institute of Science of Israel. So this will happen on uh, June 16. So we expected to see all of you to join us and, uh, and to discuss the exciting topic of uh, integrated sensing and communication together. And uh, also we, we expect to see you in many other events that we're planning to uh, organize within this ETI. Okay, so thank you very much for attending and uh, thanks a lot.